Hey there, welcome to All About Your Benjamins, the podcast with a special edition in the More Than Money series, the book that was co-written by the AGC, the community that I co-founded with my friend Taylor Schulte. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to my other friend, Stephen Fox. Um, Stephen's chapter, What Matters Most, begins on page 95 if you're following along at home. And let me give you his quick introduction from his bio. Stephen is the founder of Next Gen Financial Planning in San Diego, a place I love to visit a fee-only firm helping young professionals with investing, tax planning, student loans, and other areas of financial planning. He's an active member of the FPA, has served as the president of the San Diego chapter, and the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, aka NAPFA. Stephen was also the treasurer and volunteer coordinator for Financial Independence Training, a volunteer organization that provided financial planning to active duty Marines and sailors. 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 Can I speak very much? All right, so that is a quick introduction to Stephen. I hope you enjoyed his chapter. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you all in the next episode. So... You know, we just had a great conversation about uh, can you meet you know you giving me an update on the firm and how things are going. Um, you know, you have countless experiences with clients that you could have chosen for your chapter and more than money. Um, what was it about this particular story that jumped out to you as the one you wanted to write about? Yeah, for me that was actually a pretty easy choice when I started thinking about who I wanted to write this about. Uh, this story was about a, a young couple who they came from an extremely tough upbringing, uh, like severe poverty. Uh, like criminal background in their family, uh, gang involvement, a lot of really tough stuff that they had to get through. And they worked really hard to build great lives for themselves uh, by the time I met them around age 30 or so. And uh, great careers for themselves as well. But even with everything that they had overcome and a lot of financial success that they probably had no right to expect given where they came from, um, they still had tremendous stress and anxiety around money stuff. They were still severely disorganized. They were arguing about money all the time. They felt like they never had a month, uh, enough. And these were people that were making uh, something like $300,000 a year by that point with their careers that they they built up. Um, so I thought that uh, it was a little bit out of what a lot of people would expect. Uh, those people would still feel like they had money problems given where they'd come from and where they were now. I was also just really impressed by those people and what they managed to accomplish. I thought their story deserves a little bit of recognition. Uh, and I think they're also a good example of some principles that I really care about related to financial planning. One, that it's not only for wealthy retirees who have millions of dollars and um, have like really complex estate needs and, and need someone to manage wealth for them. Uh, and I like the, it, it demonstrates the principle of progress over perfection and also uh, people over numbers. Uh, I think those are important principles that are well, well uh, exemplified here. Well, I'm glad you went into those principles because as soon as you said there was principles that you believed in, I was going to ask you about them. But yeah. you being a great guest, you went you went straight to them. Um, there was a there's a, a comment. I don't want to I don't want to give too much away of the chapter. So for those of you at home that have the book, um, Stephen's chapter starts on page 95 called "What Matters Most." Um, if you happen to not have the book by now, shame on you. Go get a copy. Just a reminder that all of the proceeds on the AGC side of things are going to organizations like BLX and the Foundation of Financial Planning, which are financial planning organizations. Um, it's not going to us. But at the end, every chapter has a summary. And there's a comment in there um, I wanted to have you kind of dive in a little bit deeper on when you said that being a financial planner uh, can feel like being an unqualified therapist or marriage counselor. Um, kind of elaborate more on what you mean by that and, and maybe give an example, um, not too specific to where a client might know who they are, but just yeah. kind of more about that comment. Yeah, so th- that was something I figured out pretty quickly once I started working with clients that I hadn't really anticipated uh, before getting into financial planning, uh, that it, it really is more about working with people's lives and helping serve as a I don't like the term life coach, but uh, I don't know if I have a better one. But you're really working with people. Like you have to remember, we're not doing corporate finance. We're not fund analysts. The decisions that we help people make really do impact their lives in many different ways. And as part of that, that means there's a lot of emotion tied up into it and uh, a lot of conflict. It's it's really not uncommon for someone to be crying in my office when we're talking about something that's deeply important or, or painful or even exciting for them. It's not uncommon for uh, couples to... Uh, have some point of dispute pop up and they expect me to mediate it for them and tell them what they should do and pick one side over the other. That happens all the time. Uh, And that's something that 
really the, the training to become a financial planner, even if you're a CFP or whatever other credentials you might have, they don't really cover that stuff. Um, you learn all about high value of money and insurance principles and investments and all that stuff. You don't learn about how to deal with people who are going through really tough challenges in their lives and are looking for you for guidance on how to help solve them. Um, so that's something you just have to kind of learn as you go along, at least if you care about doing good work, which I think most financial planners really do realize the importance of what we do. Uh, you have to figure that out on your own over time. There isn't much training out there that can go a long ways towards helping develop that. You might you might just say that like true financial planning is more than money, right? Like the title of the book is yeah. just so perfect, um, and I, and it's very true. And and to your point, you know, growing up in the profession, like we're not taught that. And I don't even know if there's really a course. I think it's a skill set that some people have, and some may be better at it. But it's just going through the reps. And then identifying the opportunity where we can take the financial advisor hat off and be that therapist if it need be or be that marriage counselor if it need be. Um, you know, our position's unique in that we know a lot of things about our clients that maybe a lawyer or a true therapist might know and, and nobody else. And sometimes we know something about one of the spouses that the other spouse doesn't even know about, um, which I think just shows the importance of what a financial advisor brings to the table it's you know spreadsheets and all those things are important, but it's the other things that you just described and all of that. Um, you know, coming back to your chapter, what's the what's one main takeaway you hope readers or if they listen to it on the audio book take away from your chapter? Like, what would you say is the main message? Uh, I think the biggest one is that a balance sheet shouldn't only reflect financial assets and liabilities. You can also you sh you should also include non quantitative elements. So uh, a big part of the story in my chapter revolves around uh, this couple's decision about having the wife leave her job for a couple years in order to spend more time with their young son. They had a one-year-old baby at the time. And uh, they were worried about the financial impact of that when they already felt like they were stressed on cash flow and not saving enough and had all these different complexities around money stuff. They thought that that wasn't even feasible for them. Um, so if you looked at it only in terms of financial impact, her quitting the job, uh, there were a lot of things we were able to do to offset the impact, but it was a net negative overall, uh, both in the short term and the long term, probably for them financially. But you have to include the non-quantitative, non-financial benefits that you get in your decision making progress. So she knew that it was something that was really important to her to be able to spend more time with the kid. Uh, she knew that having X more dollars at X time in the future, the projections, that wasn't really worth nearly as much to her. Uh, and so as long as we are able to make things work over the short run, uh, by changing a few decisions. Uh, there was some clever stuff around there that we did um, to, to make it more feasible over the short run um, that they decided that that's what was best for them. It was worth it. So choosing the, the emotional stuff, what's important to them as people, uh, what's important in their lives and to people around them rather than uh, just what looks good on a balance sheet or a, a financial statement, financial projections. I mean, how cool is that to be a part of a process and – not that you gave them permission, but gave them the information they need and the strategy to make it happen to drastically change the happiness that they will experience in their life. Like to me, like that's what like that's so exciting to know that we you 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 had a direct impact on these clients' lives and made their life better, not because of the money decision, because you told them to make less money and have less money at the end of the day. Still, still are able to put together a plan that helps them reach their goals, but that time, that time with the kids, like I think that is so exciting and so cool. Um, how, like, how do you feel about that? Oh, it, it's awesome. I mean, that's a big part of why I do what, what I do, and why I appreciate this job and the opportunity that we get to get. Um, and also, getting I've been a little surprised to learn getting people to open up about these kinds of things. As long as you demonstrate that you're you want that, that that's what you're here for, and that's part of the process, and you're, open, you're a good listener, that's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Unless you give them some reason not to trust you, people will trust you pretty easily. And also this principle of trying to incorporate non-financial elements into financial decision-making, that applies in all other types of areas too. So maybe that would be like, maybe a simpler example would be choosing to take a job that pays you $5,000 less a year, but you don't have to drive an hour commute each way every day. What's the impact on your quality of life of having five thousand dollars versus not having a two-hour commute round trip every day? That's huge, mm -hmm. right? So there are mm -hmm. all kinds of examples where that could come into play. And sometimes people get a little bit too wrapped up in numbers and trying to optimize and save as or make as much as they can. And you just got to remember that the end goal of having that money in the first place is to benefit your life in some way. So you try to estimate 
um, all those other things as well that are tougher to quantify, but so worth attempting to do so. How do you how do you get somebody to drop the attachment to the dollar amount in your example of five thousand dollars less to have a you know a less a commute every day because we're ingrained to make more money money brings more happiness you know how do you help somebody figure out that okay the peace of mind of not being in the car the extra hour at home whatever it might be, how do you help them quantify this unquantifiable to compare and offset the income i think it's helpful to just ask lots of good questions and shut up and listen and make them mm-hmm. think through their responses so one example of that might be, you could ask them, um, okay, what's something that you spent $5,000 on within the last few years, more or less? And then ask them, how did that make you feel? Like, what do you think was the benefit of that? Uh, what was the impact of you having spent that $5,000? What would your life be like if you hadn't done that? And then you can ask them, okay, what's the difference on your quality of life between having that thing that you spent $5,000 on and then having um, a, a better commute like which one would you rather have forget numbers for a minute would you rather have that safe commute time or would you rather have this thing that you would spent five thousand dollars on and the happiness that that brought you and you, you let them answer it for themselves uh, it's similar with every type of financial decision i don't try and tell people what they should do i help mm-hmm. them make more informed decisions mm-hmm. it's not my place to tell them what they need to do in their life financially i like that i like that a lot and i i think that that's hard for a lot of advisors to you know pull themselves back and say, okay, I'm not the answer man or woman. You know, I'm more of a guide and my job is to sh- you know, show you different options, maybe give some input that I think this is better why, but ultimately let you make the decision that's best for your plan and just make sure you're not choosing one that's going to blow things up or if it is going to blow it up, you're at least aware of it. Um, so I, I like that and I think that I think more people are going to want that as time goes on and as people read this book, like a lot of the advisors in this book are having those types of conversations and those types of relationships. And you all are the ones whose firms are growing very fast and the market is saying that's what, what people want. Now, that kind of brings up our profession doesn't necessarily have the best reputation. And I would you know, not argue against that we've earned it over the years and still continue to earn it in some, some respects. But what's one mis- misconception that you hope to kind of uh, break down or debunk through your chapter or through this opportunity to just say, hey, like, this is not how all financial advisors are. This is not what the profession is. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind there is something that you, you must have heard before, but uh, a lot of financial advisors really want to push back against because it, this mindset does still exist among a lot of people out there that we're all just product salesmen, uh, that our goal as a financial planner is to get somebody into this life insurance policy or this mutual fund that pays a commission or this annuity or this reverse mortgage or whatever, um, that we are all just out for commissions and trying to generate revenue income for ourselves rather than do what's best for the clients. Uh, there's been a lot of progress made on that over recent years, but not nearly as far as we need to go on that front. The mindset of the public still needs to shift on that, in that, on that front. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, and then also that okay. even if we do uh, recommend this or this type of product to somebody, that being a good financial advisor is more about it's more than just having access to a set of tools in our toolbox and then we deploy the right tool in the right circumstance. It's also all this other stuff that we've been starting to talk about a little bit of uh, having better emotional intelligence, of uh, getting more involved in people's lives and helping them, helping them understand the impact on their life of the financial decisions that they make. It's not just about using a hammer on a nail because that's the right tool for this particular job. Uh, there's more to it than that. Well, as a, as a friend and, an, and like an, a peer in the profession, I think the way that you approach, you know, through reading the chapter, the way that you approach working with your clients, I don't think there's any question as to why you might make a recommendation. You know, you've guided them to figuring out the life that they want. You've, you've been creative to help them figure out a way to make something work. And if this is the thing that helps us accomplish this, then like there's a purpose behind it. I think where that commissions and the sales role still is that nobody asks questions. You come in, you give them some numbers and they come back with, with some type of recommendation. Like how does that play into that, that client's story? If there's no, if there's no plan, there's no questions, then, then it really is just a product sale. So I think that, you know, reading your story, people are going to realize that, you know, if an advisor's not asking me questions and not listening and not helping me build to what it is that I want, yet they have a recommendation for me, it might not be the best thing for me and it may not be true financial planning. Um, so I want to I wanna get a little personal. I think that it's good for people to see us financial professionals and kind of hear us talk about our own money. What is the best financial decision that you've made personally? 
first thing that comes to mind there is maybe a little bit unconventional, but it's it's who I chose to marry. Uh, so marrying my wife was, I think, my best financial decision because uh, a lot of reasons. The first one is that we have pretty similar values and goals around money, that we see a lot of things the same way. So it's easy to make easier to make financial related decisions, easier to make life decisions that are somehow related to money. Um, don't have to worry about conflict, about giving up something that I might want or of uh, choosing a different direction that I might otherwise choose on my own in order to appease a spouse who had different goals than me. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, also just um, divorce is expensive. Um, like the, <laughs> a, a marriage gone wrong has all kinds of financial costs, even besides, of course, the non-financial costs of it. And she's a great partner, like the best person I could have ever hoped for. So um, I think that's the first first one that comes to mind is she was my best financial decision. Uh, even though she's not like a, I don't know, wealthy uh, heiress princess that's going to inherit millions of dollars when her parents die, it's, it's not that kind of situation at all. But mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be for it to be a good financial decision. I think, I think that's great because, I mean, money is taboo. It still is. I mean, podcasts like this and other podcasts that are out there, it's great to get people talking about money more. But, you know, to think about starting out a relationship with somebody new and, and getting into the, the, the discussions about money and finances and how you handle to make sure it's a good match. Um, you know, money is one of the main reasons people get divorced. And if you can alleviate that by finding somebody that not only do you align with on like the personal side of things, but on the financial side, you guys are on the same page. Even if it is, I think having different views and different approaches is not necessarily bad as long as you know they complement rather than work against each other. Um, like I'm more of a risk taker than my wife. She's more conservative. We balance each other out. We don't have to both be risk takers or both be super conservative. It's more about, I think, having those conversations and finding a good partner and whatever makes a good partner for you. So that that's awesome. And so far, no one has had that as their um, their reason yet. So we'll see if anybody else joins you at, at that as a explanation. This is the bonus question that no one knew was coming before recording with me. Let's, let's be transparent. We talked about the good. What would you say? And I, I'm reframing this. So I just got done recording with Michael Baker and I, I framed it as what's your worst financial decision. And as we were talking, I realized I don't want to encourage shaming of financial decisions because enough of that goes on. So what would be your best financial lesson that you've learned from a decision you've made? Um, it could be a good one, or if there is one that you would go back and say, I wish I would have done things differently, or something you learned from maybe that's not the most optimal financial decision, what would that be? Probably should have done a much better job of uh, starting to save more of my income earlier on than I did. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just the, the simple principle that we all know well of, of the impact of compounding over time. If I had started earlier than I did, I'd be far ahead of where I am right now and feel a little bit mm -hmm. more secure. So I think that's probably the first thing that comes to mind uh, that lesson I, I wish I'd learned earlier and it made a mistake on. And I, I don't even think I was that bad compared to a lot of folks. So before doing this work, I was in the military and had a steady paycheck for the first time, like no real financial obligations. And I just spent basically all the money that I had at that time instead of saving and investing it. And there was a big missed opportunity there. Mm -hmm. I think, though, that's, that's one of those lessons that you know, we can preach to everybody the importance of saving early and investing and try to give them all the reasons why. And most people, I think, have to experience it themselves. Um, you know, just, I feel like it's one of those things. It's, it's also kind of like picking individual stocks. Like We can talk about diversified portfolios and how hard it is to pick stocks. And for some people, they just have to go pick a stock and have it go south and realize, hey, I don't want to spend the time, energy, and effort to make sure that's the way I manage my money. You know, the, the more traditional stuff is better. Um, I, I do want to piggyback on your your saving early, though. Um, one of the things I know you work with young professionals. One of the things I think is a great, not a story, but a, a good thing to get young professionals thinking about is starting to save early. While it's great for retirement, it's ideal for your mid career because it gives you optionality. And I use yeah. myself as an example with this with my clients and other young professionals. We started saving and investing early. We were fortunate to do pretty good out of college. Um, and we live in the Midwest, so we have low cost of living. But because of that saving and investing we did and the benefit of a good market during that time, I was able at 40, middle of my life, not a midlife crisis quite yet, to start making some changes and take some other risks and scale back because if we see the same things we've seen in history with the markets and saving and compound interest, 
that early years allowed me to not have to save as much today, which means I can work a little less harder and not have to make as much money. I can spend a little bit more money on the experiences with my boys and still be on good pace for what my retirement looks like down the road. And then I can come in in the back end of my career and, and top it off. So if I didn't save and invest, what I'm able to do today would be a lot different. And I don't think I would be in a position to be as happy as I am because I have that nest egg that's working for me over the long run. So to me, when I think about telling a young person to save, it's not for retirement. It's so that when you get 40 and you have kids and like maybe you want to plateau for a while or, or, or take a sabbatical or something, you don't have to worry about, well, I'm missing out and in saving investing because you've got a nest egg that's doing a lot of work for you that you started when you were younger. Yep, I agree 100%. I think a lot of people significantly underweight the importance of flexibility in financial planning. Uh, that mm -hmm. I, I think that's almost more important than uh, like the the amount saved over time and like building up net worth of like having the right amount of flexibility at the right time. And some another example of a way that that might manifest itself is uh, the decision to buy versus rent a home. So that's that's one major benefit of renting over buying is that it's a lot easier to move for whatever reason you might want to. Maybe you have like a family member that you is sick and you want to be able to move closer and take care of them, or maybe you want to move to a different job. Uh, that has this benefit for you or that pays significantly more, uh, just having that flexibility to move from one place to another is uh, significantly under, undervalued, I think. And also uh, the type of account that you save into, even if it saves you more dollars in the present, uh, it's, I don't think it's necessarily always ideal to put everything you can into pre-tax retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, it might make more sense to spread that out across taxable and Roth so you can use that money before retirement age when something comes up because there's no way we can all predict what's going to happen every event in our lives over the next 30 years and, and what's going to be needed. So. I agree. Flexibility is very important. And I try to keep that principle in mind with almost every financial decision. And that allows you as an advisor to be a little bit more creative with your recommendations. And for me, yeah. creativity in everything that I do is something I want to do. So I don't want to do the same thing over and over. I want to be creative with, with how we structure things. Um, you know, coming back to the book and, and, and to your chapter, you know, there was an investment of your time and energy. You, know, you, you write and revision and contribute. Um, you're busy, you've got a, a thriving business, you have a great family, young kids. What was the decision for deciding to take on um, writing a chapter for the book? Yeah, I decided to do it because, uh, one, I just think it's important values, uh, important principles to be spreading out to the general public. And that's part of the reason why I started my own firm in the first place is to help shift the conversation around what it means to be a financial planner just a little bit. And this is a, a way to help uh, expand that. Uh, so just helping spread the good word. Um, I like the opportunity to collaborate with like-minded peers, uh, like the AGC in particular. It's not the only example of it, but it's a great example of uh, this collaborative mindset that exists in a lot of our industry that I, I always do what I can to try to support. I'm, I'm really thankful for this community that you and, and just, uh, Taylor have built together. Um, I think it's something you guys should be really proud of. And if I can help support a, an important project from that group, I'm happy to do so. Uh, it was a chance to just pr practice writing skills something I've, I've wanted to get better at and uh, every opportunity to do a little bit more is, is only going to be good for me to help learn. Uh, it was my first chance to ever work with like a real book editor before. Uh, so I enjoyed that, that aspect of it. Uh, raise money for a good cause. Uh, I think it's also nice to, uh, for that client to just know that their story is being told out there and that it might help inspire other people at least a little bit. So a lot mm -hmm. of good reasons to do this. It was, it was a pretty easy choice. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to contribute to it um, because I genuinely believe that if one of, the, one of the advisors didn't write their chapter, this book would not be complete. Like it is complete as it is today. I think we're going to do a second round. So those who didn't miss out the first time will have their opportunity and it, that book will be perfect as well. But your chapter highlighted a story unique from everybody else's that makes this book complete for the first go round. So, so thank you for contributing. And also thank you for being the advisor that you are. Um, I think our job sometimes is, is thankless. I think our clients sometimes thank us, but not as much as we might you know, want to know that we're making the impact. So as a, as a peer, again, knowing the work that you're doing, reading the story and having conversations with you, I just want to thank you for being an advisor that's moving our profession forward um, and, and breaking those stereotypes that we want to try to break down earlier on. Thanks. Um, Appreciate that. So as we kind of wrap things up, as, if we, as we wrap things up, where if people want to follow you, learn more about you know, the, the work that you do, um, you know, social media, blogs, whatever it might be, where would you direct people to follow you? Not very active on social media, except sometimes LinkedIn. Uh, best place to learn okay. anything more about my work would be at our website, nextgenfinancialplanning.com. All right. And everybody's going to have their own blog post on All About Your Benjamins, which will have show notes and links to all those things. So um, that way everybody can find you if, if they want to. So 
Uh, Stephen, one more time, thank you for joining me today to, to talk about your chapter. Thanks for contributing to the book. Everybody at home, thank you for supporting the book. Again, hopefully you've already purchased it. If not, go purchase it now. Um, hit up page 95 is where Stephen's chapter starts. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. And remember that financial planning, financial services, everything that we are about as advisors is not just about the spreadsheets. It's more than money. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you all in the next episode.